So we started talking last week uh, as we started talking about, you know, those last seven days that Jesus was, uh, was here uh, on the earth, and so uh, it's pretty significant. Let me, let me just tell you a little bit about this. I don't know if you ever figured this out yet or, or saw it before, but, you know, the, the, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are all our four writings of basically the same story, the story of the life of Jesus, right? All from different perspectives and from different lens angles. Out of those four Gospels, there are 89 chapters, 89 chapters in four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Jesus lived 33 and a half years here on the earth. And I want you to think about this, that in those 89 chapters, the first 30 years only take up four chapters of, of the Gospels. The first 30 years, four chapters are devoted to the first 30 years. That means the remaining 85 chapters of the Gospels are for the last three and a half years that Jesus was here on the earth. Hold on a minute. Because out of those last 85 chapters remaining, 29 of those chapters are the last week. So I want you to think about the amount of real estate that God chose to put into the scriptures devoted to the last week of his life. Why did he do that? Because it is a representation of the culmination for why he came to the earth. It's why he came. And so there's so much devoted to it. We're actually spending some time. We're going to do that next week, obviously, on Easter Sunday. And i got something special for you. I'm so excited. I, I was tempted to do Easter Sunday message today and then figure it out next week as we go. But, but we're staying on track. I'm staying focused. Amen. And then the following week, we're going to talk about something that took place uh, also um, after uh, Easter. And so uh, it's going to be an amazing time. The Lord's doing some things in my own heart as we prepare uh, over these series of weeks here in, um, in March. Um, can you believe it's... Typically, I think of Easter Sunday in April, but it's in March. Sometimes it happens. Um, just it's coming on us like a freight train, and so we're so excited about that. So, so Andrew, by the way, didn't he do a good job today reading that scripture for you in John chapter 12? And again, that's what I'm talking about. So that is John's account of this thing that we're celebrating today called Palm Sunday. Uh, the last week enters in as Jesus, they call it the triumphant entry into Jerusalem, starts that last week that he was here on the earth. We're going to spend our time in there today talking about what that all means for us here in 2024. He was in John 12. I'm going to actually get into Luke's uh, gospel or his version of the, of the triumphant entry, that Palm Sunday uh, in, in Luke chapter 19, beginning with verse number uh, 29. It says it like this, as he approached Bethpage of Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you. As you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden before. So it's, it's brand new. It's, it's not a certified colt. It is brand new, right? <laughs> Untie it. Now watch this. I don't know if you find sometimes in the, when you read the, the scriptures, I get so much humor when I read in there. It's just part of how God made me, I guess. He says, untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying our colt? <laughs> Say to them, the Lord needs it. Here's what I want you to do. You're going to leave service today. Uh, you're going you're to get on the 15 freeway. You're going to start heading north. You're going to get into Ontario, and there's a street in Ontario called Inland Empire Boulevard. There's a Porsche dealership there in, in Ontario. <laughs> Sitting on their showroom floor, there is a Porsche 911 Sport Coupe. It's an eight-speed. It has a 3.0 twin-turbo engine. It's black with black stitched interior. It's only about $175,000. And I want you to sit in the car and I want you to start it up. And when someone asks you, why are you starting up this car? I want you to say to them, because my pastor has need of it. <laughs> okay. Actually, don't do that, right? I, have, I, I, need to, I need to say this. Actually, do not do that, okay? Okay. 
uh, I, 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 because I'm telling you, there's someone watching online right now. I need to make this disclaimer. There's someone watching online right now who hadn't been saved but about 10 minutes. And they're just crazy enough to go do it. So I'm saying don't do that. Right? By the way, um, how, how many of you all know that everybody has, we all have at least one crazy person in our family? How many you know what I'm talking about? It's, it's a cross between Cousin Eddie and Cousin It, but you know who that person is. Like when I said, we've got one crazy person in our family, you immediately had that picture in your mind, right? Right? And then now those of you who do not know who that crazy person is, it's probably you. That's all I'm saying. That's, that's all I'm saying. Okay, so watch, let's keep, keep on going. He said, the Lord needs it. Verse 35, they brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt and put Jesus on it. So let's back, let's back up a little bit. I skipped something? I don't think I did, right? Verse 35, they brought, they brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt and put it on it and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd, someone say whole crowd, of disciples. Now these aren't necessarily the 12 disciples, it's the crowd of followers who are now following Jesus. And by the way, this crowd is getting bigger and bigger, particularly since the last miracle that he just performed was raising Lazarus from the dead, which was pretty cool, okay? So the whole crowd of disciples begin to joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. So some, some, some of the gospels use these words. Hosanna, Hosanna is he who comes into the name of the Lord. Amen. Verse 39, some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. In other words, we don't worship like this. This is over the top. This isn't how we do it. You got to get them under control, right? This is too much. And what's so sad to me is that the people who heard that followed after it. And the same crowd who on Sunday, Palm Sunday, who waved palm branches and were hail, hailing Hosanna, Hosanna, were the same crowd five days later who yelled, crucify him. Crucify him. And Jesus makes this statement in verse 40. I tell you, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. In other words, if they don't praise me, see these rocks? They're going to have to cry out and praise me but someone's going to praise me. Look at someone right now sitting around you and say to them, ain't no rock going to outpraise me. Look at the other person on the other side of you, which is obviously your second choice, and say to them, ain't no rock going to take my place. Ain't no rock going to take my place. I know that's bad English, but it's good preaching. How many know what I'm talking about? So I've got, I've got three simple points for you today and then we're, then we're going to be finished here but if you're taking notes write this down something is getting our worship something is getting our worship now as a pastor you can imagine how many times over the years that I've come across people who have said mostly guys you know PD I'm just not the stand up worship out loud clap my hands sing those songs out loud kind of guy it's just not my flow like, it's just not, it's not my jam. I just don't, that's not what I do. It's not in my DNA, okay? But I tell you and I guarantee you that if I could shadow that guy long enough, I will find the source of his passion. By the way, God doesn't have a problem with you expressing your love to something else. Let me, let me give you a good definition of worship. We've talked about this before. Worship is love expressed. I, I can take it one further. If it's not expressed in some way, it's, it's not genuine worship. And God doesn't have a problem with you expressing love to other things. 
He, he gave you this world and life to enjoy. Jesus says, the thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy, but I have come that you might have and enjoy life in abundance to the full until it overflows. So God, God doesn't mind, he doesn't mind you expressing love to other things. What he does mind is when your expression to those other things are at a higher level than what you're giving him. You tracking with me? Like 70,000 people can jump up and down, shout, holler, throw their hands in the air in a football stadium, and we call that that they're a fan. But you do that in church, and you're a fan addict. A fan addict. A fanatic. Are you tracking with me? Right? Amen. I'm just trying to say today it would do us all good to shine a light on that which is that which we placed on the throne of our hearts because it's something for everybody. It's something for everybody. One day Jesus was asked by one of the teachers of the law, what do you think is the most important commandment? In other words, what's the most important scripture? Of course, they had the Old Testament only at that time. What, what do you think, Jesus, is the most important verse in the Bible? And Jesus actually obliges that request. And he says this in Mark chapter 12, verse 29. I'm going to read this out of the Passion Translation. I thought it was appropriate because we're in Passion Week. Jesus answered him, the most important of all the commandments is this. The Lord Yahweh, our God, is one. And you are to love the Lord your God with a passionate heart from the depths of your soul, with your every thought, and with all your strength. The New King James Version says, to love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. In other words... Whatever has captured the highest level of your passion, hear me, church, will always demand a response from your life. Uh, Pastor Dick Hillary, who founded our church many, many years ago, um, back when it was called Word Faith Fellowship, those of you who knew him uh, knew that he was an amazing singer. Uh, uh, he would fill up arenas full of people uh, thousands would come and, and, and one standing ovation after another. Just an amazing gospel singer. Um, he, he got his start in Civic Light Opera, singing classical Broadway mu musical stuff. He gave his life to the Lord and he began his ministry at leading choirs like he led choir, the choir at, he was the choir director for uh, Hollywood Presbyterian Church, very large church. He continued from there in different musical directing, leading uh, capacities in churches so, so that when he finally became a pastor, much of the training that he had and the love of his life, which was those Southern gospel songs and those classic hymns, he, he literally incorporated into the church that he founded and built up. Uh, it's part of our culture here at, at Cross Hill Church our heritage. And let, let me just say it like this. I love what God is doing in modern day worship. That the anointing that God is placing on worship songs that are being generated in modern day worship is absolutely amazing. I love it. I love it. I love it. You heard some of that today. But, but can I just say, I, I, I love the old stuff too. <laughs> like, I, I love those, those, some of those old hymns, P probably because it's part of my heritage. It's part of, part of my, what, what I was made up with. And so, we, so we, we, well, you'll, you'll often hear us bring those in. I, as much as we love that, we should never as a church, this is, just my, this is just me just talking out loud here, we should never give up what God did before that. There's an there's a amazing uh, old hymn writer by the name of Isaac Watts. Isaac Watts wrote some songs like Joy to the World that we sing at Christmas time. You didn't know that, huh? 
He also wrote a song, a hymn called, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. Um, in other words, when I look at, when I survey, when I not just glance at, not just think about around March or April at Christmas time, but when I, at Easter time, but when I do a deep dive, a deep dive into the wondrous cross, and I see what the Prince of Glory did for me on that cross. He said it demands a response from my life. And he, he, there's a verse in that hymn, it says it like this, were the whole realm of nature mine that were a present far too small, love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. Wow. I just, I just felt like coming to you today and kind of sharing my heart's cry, Cross Hill Church, that as we enter into Passion Week, that we let our hosannas begin to rise up within us. We, we sang about that today. Hosanna, praise is rising. And it's my heart's cry is that we, as we enter this week, no matter what you've got going on in the peripheral, that your level of passion will match the level of the passion week, the passion of the Christ. Amen. Here, here's, here's point number two. We okay? We doing okay? The greatest obstacle to our worship is fear of guilt and shame. Many people, and I, I thought about this illustration, <laughs> kind of hesitated a little bit, but here it comes. Many people treat their relationship with God like they're going to lunch at the Cracker Barrel. Anybody ever been to Cracker Barrel? I, I, not, not so much here in California. Got a few of them there, but, but you go into other states, like I, I'm in the dairy industry, and when I, when I, when I go into the, one of those other states to visit one of those other dairy plants, the locals there are always like, hey, Doug, we're going to take you to the barrel. We going to the barrel. We going to get some cinnamon toast at the barrel. And, and and you know it's good food. Yeah, you know, like I, I like a Cracker Barrel, but but the ambiance is really a lot like it's it's a lot like um, a Sanford and Son yard sale. You know, what I'm saying it's just like like there's just knickknacks all over the walls that make no sense. Like the decor just makes absolutely no sense. And you got this this rusted out old farm equipment hanging from the ceiling on some little thin cord, you know? And so when you're eating the Cracker Barrel, you're, always, you're like, <laughs> like, can we get another booth? One that's not sitting directly under, preferably under the, the horse castrator, like maybe we can go somewhere else. Come on, somebody, right? And I, and I know, I know that's, we're just being a little crazy right now, like just conjuring up the spirit, the spirit of Tim Hawkins a little bit, okay? <laughs> so, so, so watch this say, so check it out, check it out. So, so here's what I got out of that. I know it's funny, but, but check this out. A lot of people treat their relationship with God like that. Yes. Like at any minute, he's gonna come crashing down on them and pounce on them for everything bad that they did in their life, right? Like, like they, they got this picture of God. You know that scripture says, God, his eyes run to and fro throughout the whole earth, but they changed the end of that verse. His eyes run to and fro throughout the whole earth because he's got a big hammer in his hand and he's getting ready to pounce on you. Like, I saw that, bam, right? That's their relationship. They, they treat it like, like, like God is like, like the great Oz from the Wizard of Oz. And, and we're the cowardly Christians coming to him approaching him like <laughs> and, and here, here's, here, here's the great God Oz he's behind that veil he's behind that curtain he's like silence how dare you come to me the great Oz what do you want I just want to go home right well I, I got news for you today our, 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 our God is not the great Oz he is the great I am and he's not, he's not hidden behind some veil where you don't have access to him. In fact, that veil has been ripped right open. And now you and I have access to come boldly, I said boldly, into the throne of grace by the blood of Jesus. That's good news. 
Ha, 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 devil. Yeah. Ha, ha. Right? Good news. Good news. Amen. I, I, Isaiah, but, but a lot of people, they, they, they feel like their relationship with God is just this one where he's going to come crashing down on them. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1. Amazing passage of scripture. It says, it starts out like this. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, Isaiah said, high and exalted, seated on a throne. And the train of his robe filled the, t- the temple. So, 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 so let, me, let me share this with you. Isaiah goes to church. And while he's at church, something happens. He's in the temple. Now, what do you do when you go to, what's one of the main things we do when we come to church? We worship, okay? We worship. No doubt that when Isaiah went to church that day, his intent was to worship. And we don't know, but that he was, at, he was in worship mode. But something happened that stopped him in his worship. And this is where we pick up the text because the text says that this is a church service like no other church service. But it also makes mention that it's this church service is occurring at a pivotal point in the nation of Judah's history. Okay, this is like none other because it says it like this, in the year that King Uzziah died. I could skip over that, but I need to talk to you about it. Uzziah was the ninth king of Judah. He took over the reign from his father when he was 16 years old. 16. God had given him wisdom beyond his years. And he literally reigned over the nation of Judah for 52 years. Huge for any king. 52 years. Long time. And most of his reign, he honored God. He, in fact, he was, one, he was the guy who brought worship back into the temple. He honored God, and, and as a result, God continued to bless him, brought great prosperity, prosperity to the nation. Now, he, he didn't end up that way. He actually, towards the end of his life, sadly to say, his pride, he got, had pride in his heart, and he made some horrible mistakes, and, and his life and his throne was judged for it. I don't have time. I wish I had time to get into that. I don't. But let me just say that, that most of his reign as king over Judah was, was, was an honor to God. And God answered him by giving him victory after victory. They had probably the highest level of national security that they had ever experienced. It was absolutely amazing. Uh, the, the people were living in prosperity. Uh, their enemies feared them. Uh, their greatest enemies and their greatest threats, the Assyrians would never come against Judah as long as Uzziah was king. The king of Assyria, as long as Uzziah was the king and sitting on the throne, the king of Assyria would never come against them. Why, Why am I telling you guys this? Because the year that King Uzziah died, the entire nation was panicked with an uncertain future. And so here we pick it up. It's an uncertain future. They don't know what's going to happen. The king that brought so much great prosperity and security is now out of the scene. And this is the backdrop of when Isaiah sees the Lord at church. And while everyone is worrying, I brought a prop. What does Isaiah say God is doing? Everyone's worrying. God is sitting. He's not worrying. (laughs) <laughs> He's not panicking. The king with the little K is died. But the king with the big K is still sitting on his throne. He's still seated, seated on his throne. Amen. 
John the Revelator said it like this in Revelation chapter 4. Behold, I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. And when I looked through that door, I saw a throne in heaven, and someone was sitting on it. I brought some good news with me today. There is a throne. Someone is sitting on it. And it's not you. So why are you trying to sit in God's chair? Why do you keep trying to sit where only God can sit? Oh, God sent me with a word for somebody here at Cross Hill Church to tell somebody to remind and, and to remind you that the weapons of your warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And while you've been walking around worrying, you ought to been worrying. You, you've been worrying, but you but you you've been worrying, but you ought to have been warring. Why? Because the king with the big K is still sitting on his throne. And he's not worried. He's not pacing the halls of heaven wondering, uh, oh my, what's going to happen in November this year during the elections. He's not fretting over what the Dow Jones Industrial Average is doing on a weekly average. Come on, somebody. I'm saying, if God's not worried about it, why are you sitting in his chair worrying about it? Amen. Verse 2. Watch this. Oh, my. I'm about to preach myself fun here. Here we go. Verse number, verse number 2. Above him... Above him, he saw this image of God, and watch this, were seraphim. Now, seraphim, just a quick little it's an angel, but it's plural, okay? These are plural angels, okay? Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings, they covered their faces. With two, they covered their feet. And with two, they were flying, and they were calling to one another. Here's what they were saying. Watch this. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Sounds, sounds like a worship scene to me, doesn't it? And the whole earth is full of his glory. So they're, they're worshiping, they're, they're praising God. Verse 4, at the sound of their worship, at the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the thresholds shook and the temple was filled with smoke. Watch this, watch this, watch this, watch this. In that holy moment, something happens to Isaiah and suddenly... Everyone in the room is worshiping except for him. I'd argue that this happens to some people every weekend when they come to church. They come into the presence of God, and in that, in the, in the, in that presence where God has manifested his presence, suddenly they sense how big and how holy God is. And that's when the enemy shows up to remind them just how unholy they are. And they'll say things like, you know, you are something else. You got some nerve to stand up and sing those songs, clap your hands. After everything you did, you're a hypocrite. If the people around you only knew what you've done, you would sit down and be quiet. And, and Isaiah says this in verse 5, woe to me. Remember, they're worshiping. Suddenly, he's not worshiping. Watch what he says. Woe to me. I cried. I am ruined. One translation says, I am doomed for I have sinned. For I am a, a man of unclean lips. And I've and I live among people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Now, now apparently, Isaiah got in that holy moment, and he saw a perfect God, and it reminded him how imperfect he was. As, and, and isn't it interesting that Isaiah actually begins to zoom in on that one area of his life that he was not proud of? 
I've got unclean lips, right? I mean, he just goes off about these lips. I've got, I got filthy lips. And, and in his mind, this has got to be like the thing that he is most convicted of because, because he raises it up to like the highest, like on the highest level of the sin chart. He says, I don't, I have filth, my lips are filthy. I got filthy lips. And I look around and everybody's got filthy lips. It's like a potty mouth pandemic in the, in the nation of Judah. It reminds me of that one lady who went to her pastor and said, Pastor, I got to get my tongue on the altar. And he said, dear Lord in heaven, woman, there's not an altar in this church big enough for that. Anyway, so, 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 so watch this. I love, I love what God does next. Watch it. Look at verse 6. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth and said, see, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin purged. <laughs> wow. What an amazing Old Testament picture of salvation. Could it be that God was giving Isaiah a picture of amazing grace? In chapter 6 of his life, so that by the time the guy who gave out more messianic prophecies than anyone, by the time he gets to chapter 53 and 54, he, he's got, he, 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 he has a revelation of this grace, the grace of the Messiah. Wow. Could it be? Could it be amazing? I just, I don't know about you, but I think it's amazing how the very thing that Isaiah was hung up on, how he's, what he zoomed in on was the very thing that God used to illustrate for him exactly what he was forgiven of. Point is, God will always meet you at the level of your greatest deficiency and defect. He'll always do it. He'll always meet you at the greatest. God, he could, what, if, what if Isaiah would have said, my hands are so unclean. I got these unclean hands, these filthy hands that have been used for evil, to, to do evil. I got filthy hands. I look around, he's got filthy, everybody's got filthy hands. What do you think? Do you, I, I, think I, I think that angel would have flown over there and touched his hands with that coal. Because, watch this, because God will always meet you at the level of your greatest defect and deficiency. Why? In order to bring you to the, to the greatest level of your purpose. What is your greatest purpose? To love him unhindered with all of your heart, with all of your soul, without guilt and shame, with all of your mind, and with all of your strength. Do you believe that today? Amen. La last point, and then we're about done here. Okay, this is number three. Okay, I'm forgiven. Now what's my response? Okay, I'm forgiven, pastor. Now what's my response? Ephesians chapter one, starting in verse number three. Now what, what I want you guys to do is I want you to pay attention and, and try to note every past tense phrase that we're about to read. In other words, not something that has yet to happen, something that is already done, okay? So number three, I'm forgiven. Now what's my response? Ephesians chapter one, verse three. Praise be to God, <laughs> to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Can we just pause right now and just give praise to the God who has done so much for us? Come on, let's just do that. Come on, don't stop. Let's just keep that up. Come on, let's do it. Yeah. Think about what he's done for you. Amen. Who has blessed us with every spiritual, notice has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him when? Before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame, forgiven, What's the word? Before him in love, having predestined, it's already happened, predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will 
So the praise of the glory of his grace by which he made, not his making, which he made us accepted in the beloved. Church, please hear me this morning. According to this passage, because of what Jesus did for me, I am already blessed, forgiven, adopted, and accepted by Almighty God. And so are you. Come on, I said, and so are you. Amen. I'm telling you, this is so good. Is is this doing anything for anybody? I'm telling you, grace, like, is the greatest thing in the world if you know what Jesus did for you. But if you don't understand, you will be in a worship setting like this and literally push his presence away and not recognize what is available for you right here. Like what's, what's for you here and now? It's a picture of the crowd on Palm Sunday who had their answer right in front of them but forgot five days later. I, I think we need to ask ourselves, like I'm not trying to get in your space this morning. You, you guys, I hope you know my heart by now. I'm just, I'm just thinking that we need to ask ourselves the question, have we forgotten? Like, I, like at one point, you, you think back, there was a moment when he saved you. And you know what that felt like, the passion that rose up on the inside of you, set free, redeemed in, in a way that no one else could have ever done it. He did it like that, just picked you up, turned you around, set your feet on solid ground. Amazing. And you remember the passion that you had when you would, in those early days, remember you'd wave palm branches spiritually. I'm talking about, this is, a, this is symbolic here, but you, or you call out Hosanna, Hosanna. But a little bit of time has passed. So I'm just, I'm just asking, have we, have we forgotten, right? Have we, have we forgotten how he saved us, delivered us, how he broke our addictions, our depressions, our curses, our fears, the anxieties, our failures, our hopelessness. And on top of that, he made us citizens of heaven. Have we, have we forgotten? Because if we haven't forgotten, then it demands a response. And our attitude ought to be, ain't no rock gonna take my place. Amen? Come on, is that your attitude today? I know it is. I know it is. Pray with me, Heavenly Father. Gotta thank you for all you've done for us in this place today. God, as we as we enter in this holy week, it is truly our heart's desire that we will that we will raise our level of worship and praise to the highest level to match the, the passion of the Christ week. We thank you, God, that, that you have changed us literally from the inside out. We are, we are representatives of the world who, who desperately need to know who Jesus is. God, we thank you that you've given us the opportunity to, to worship you and to, to praise you not, not out of just tradition or just because it's something that we do because people are looking, but God, because it's coming out of our hearts cry. It's, we're not gonna let any rocks out praise us. I pray for every person here today. That maybe this week, we're going into a week of triumphant entry, but for some this week, it doesn't feel very triumphant. Really, it kind of feels kind of rough. Maybe they're facing some things that are looming over them that are just difficult all around. They just you know, thanks God that they're just having to deal with. I pray, Father God, that you will just lift them up, give them the strength, surround them with, as as with a shield, surround them with your favor, I pray in Jesus' name. Remind them who they are and who's with them and who bought them and who paid for them in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. While every head's bowed, I just wanna wanna look right there in that camera and even say to everybody in this room, if you have not... accepted Jesus as your personal Savior, 
I'd like to invite you to know him. Just simply say this out loud. Dear Lord Jesus, I am a sinner and I'm in need of a savior. I ask that you forgive me of all my sin. Come into my heart. I'll make you my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Listen, you prayed that very, very simple prayer. We believe you got born again today. We got something we want to give you, get you on your way. If you're online watching, click on the comment link. Say, Pastor Doug, that was me. Pray for me. Anyway, hey guys, love you so very much. Remember, this is our opportunity this week to shine. Uh, do, do what you got to do. Do your best. Uh, uh, make Jesus famous, okay? Here we go. Ready? Do me a favor, will you please? Turn around and tell two or three people how blessed you were to see them in God's house again. And God bless you.